I've put together um, this little presentation for a course which I've taught a couple of times at uh, different universities. Um, this, the theme of the course was Indian culture through biography. Uh, the idea was for people who have absolutely no, no idea or very little idea about India, I wanted to introduce India through the lives of so many persons. I started with the life of Buddha. And from there, I went to the life of Krishna, and eventually to the life of Lord Chaitanya, and some others, um, and eventually I came to the life of Shiva Prabhupada. And prior to um, presentation on Shiva Prabhupada. I spoke on the life of um, Mohandas Karam Mohandas Karamdas Chand Karam Chand uh, Gandhi, better known as Mahatma Gandhi. And so in this presentation about Shiva Prabhupada I'm also doing a bit of comparison. And as devotees, we may not feel very comfortable with such a comparison. That's why we feel like, how can you compare Shiva Prabhupada to anyone? <laughs> no matter how great and famous they might be. At the same time, I think it's, uh, it's worth giving some attention to, uh, if for no other reason than that Srila Prabhupada saw himself as a follower of Gandhi for some time. Um, he was quite a serious follower until he met his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur. Well, um, so this is also something of a work in progress uh, as far as the visuals go and, and I've also made some notes um, in English uh, and what I'm doing here is just giving a sort of overview of some of the basic points about Prabhupada for people who have no idea who he is. He was born as Abhay Charande in Calcutta in the year 1896, and um, in terms of his social standing, he was born into what might be called a middle class family that was um, associated with a certain Vaishya community, the Suvarnamanic uh, gold dealers. Although Srila Prabhupada's father was a cloth merchant. Um, I'd like to say that the biography of Srila Prabhupada, written by <coughs> Satsurup Das Goswami, originally came out in six volumes, English version, and each volume had a different title. And the, the title of the first volume was A Lifetime in Preparation. And I've always liked I li I've always liked the title, and I've also liked the, the the content, the subject of that first volume, telling about Shiva Prabhupada's his life prior to his coming to the West. And I think the title of the book was very appropriate: a lifetime in preparation. As we know, Shiva Prabhupada. Uh, was how what was the age of Srila Prabhupada when he arrived in New York? 
Almost 70, that's true. If it's 69, it's almost 70. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so usually don't, usually people don't go venturing off um, to the other side of the globe alone with no money um, at such an age. But as we know, Srila Prabhupada was no ordinary person. Um, he went to this college called Scottish Churches College, and as the name suggests, this was founded by some missionaries, Christian missionaries, from Scotland, uh, and it has become a quite highly respected college to the present day in Calcutta. Uh, they, if you go on the web, uh, if you look on Wikipedia, you'll see they give a list of several, maybe not for us, but well-known, prominent people who have been graduates of Scottish Churches College. I visited there a couple of times many years ago uh, when no classes were going on. Uh, and it was interesting to imagine Srila Prabhupada there as as a young man in his early 20s, uh, hearing from you know, his professor Urquhart, um, uh, expressing his doubt uh, about uh, the um, reality of karma. And at the time, Prabhupada explains to us years later, he said, at that time I did not know how to refute him. I felt he is wrong, but I didn't know how to refute him. He had not yet met Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur. Well, in 1920, Prabhupada um, graduated from the college. He had uh, studied philosophy um, and English and at least these two English and philosophy. And, um, but he rejected his diploma. Now imagine going to university, you go for three years or four years, and you work very hard and you pass all the exams. Why? Because you're hoping that you're going to get this piece of paper at the end of it all that says, yes, I did it. Um, Srila Prabhupada rejected his diploma. It was a political statement. It was... Um, protest against the British, the British presence in India, uh, because by this time, by 1920, um, the Indian independence movement had come into quite some strong momentum, especially with Gandhi. Uh, and of course that's a long story, but uh, at that time Prabhupada was like many young uh, students, university students, um, being very politically conscious, and wanting to do something to change, uh, change the world. Uh, so Prabhupada continued following Gandhi, and another symbolic gesture he made was uh, that he would wear what's called khadi cloth. Uh, khadi means it's. Um, cotton cloth, which is um, a dhoti is made uh, by hand loom. Um, a 
as, as opposed to machine-made, uh, because this was a major sort of idea of Gandhi is um, India needs to become independent um, economically, not just politically, and that means we have to produce our own uh, goods. And how to produce our own goods? Well, um, let's start with making our own cloth. So you see this image, um, you saw this image, you didn't see it, it's coming. Here's an image <laughs> of Gandhi on the top, a, a famous photo of him. Uh, I believe this was taken when he was in prison at one time. And he has this uh, spinning wheel. So the idea was he was trying to get people in India by the by the millions, everyone should be spinning cloth as a, as a um, patriotic effort. So Prabhupada was not doing that, but uh, he was wearing the cloth that was handmade, and that was a political statement. Here's an image of uh, Scottish Church's College. But then in 1922, Srila Prabhupada met Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Goswami Thakur. Initially against his will, you could say. It was a friend of Prabhupada's at that time, Abhay Charan, who had before this time, briefly before, had met Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur and was very impressed. And he thought, oh, uh, Abhay Charan Babu, you should also come. You really should meet this Swami. He's really nice. He's really impressive. And Prabhupada at that time was very skeptical. Why was he skeptical? Because he had seen so many sadhus uh, who he felt were not really sadhus. People whom his father had invited uh, for, for dinner at their home. His father, um, Gormohande, thank you, uh, was very pious Vaishnava, and uh, he felt this was his duty. So he would invite these people. Prabhupada, as a young man, as, as a young boy, he would see them and he would think, ah, this is not a real son. So then when uh, his friend said, you have to come meet this sadhu, he said, um, no thanks, I, I've met so many. Said, no, really, you should, meet, you should meet him. He's, yeah, he's very special. Well, he finally persuaded him, fortunately. Uh, and the place which they met, I, I need to insert another image, which I didn't get to here, but... Um, the building on the roof of which, flat roofs in India typically, on the roof of which uh, they met, that building is now owned by ISKCON. Uh, it's in central North Calcutta. And the idea is uh, at some point to renovate the building and make it a nice center. How do we know about Srila Prabhupada's life, one could ask? Well, uh, we know from his own comments, Prabhupada spoke um, with his disciples on different occasions, uh, uh, many conversations where he would share his memories. And um, much of that went into what has been called the official biography of Prabhupada, as I said, six volumes, um, which was also um, compiled from many, many interviews, uh, file cabinets full of interviews uh, when they were transcribed. <clears throat> also, of course, we have Prabhupada's books and we have uh, his letters, some 6,000 letters. So I think, was it 6,000 letters? A lot of letters. 
in any case. Um, and then his lectures and his conversations. Um, we have a record of Prabhupada's which is really very extensive. 37 volumes of his recorded conversations. And we have a growing number. The, the number has not stopped yet. We have a growing number of memoirs. Memoir means someone is sharing their memories. So we have, for example, uh, five volumes of Arisori Prabhu, his uh, diaries. I think he's also in here. Um, different sort of geographical memoirs. There's a book uh, that was done by uh, Bhakti Gauravani Goswami about Shiva Prabhupada in Germany. Um, there's one about South Africa. There's actually several such books. And I mentioned yesterday we have uh, Ravinder, not Ravinder, we have uh, Shabbat Prabhu's book. Um, the first volume, Chasing Rhino with the Swami, and, uh, and such, such literature as this. We also have uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami's diary, uh, in which he, he kept diary of the last days of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, just some impressions, images. On the top you see Gandhi sitting with Jawaharlal Nehru, who became the first Prime Minister of India. Um, it's ironic in some ways that Nehru became the Prime Minister in that the, the vision that Gandhi had for India and the vision that Nehru had for India, you could say, were 180 degrees opposite from each other. Um, Gandhi had an idea of a return to village culture, uh, self-sufficiency, all these kind of ideas were there. Um, we could say uh, something like simple living and high thinking. Uh, in fact, that phrase, I'm not sure whether it came from Gandhi or from another source. Prabhupada, of course, quoted it many times. Well, um, the fate of India seems to have been sealed, so to say, um, by these two figures. Um, but um, it's certainly not the whole story. And, and a very important component of the story of India, we can say, is Srila Prabhupada. Uh, and this has been, at least in some ways, recognized. Uh, the Indian government, some years ago, issued, this was 1997, issued uh, a postage stamp with Srila Prabhupada. I think the devotees arranged that they promoted with the government so that this would happen. This is a letter uh, to Gandhi by Srila Prabhupada. And I want to read this because um, it's quite prophetic. Prophetic means kind of um, telling what the future will be. Prabhupada wrote to Gandhi in July 1947. Please accept my respectful namaskar. I am your unknown friend. But I had to write to you at times and again, although you never cared to reply then. This is not the first letter from Gandhi. He never got a reply. Of course, Gandhi was getting probably thousands of letters. Um, the collected works of Gandhi in written, printed form uh, Come, come to 90, I think it's 98 
very thick volumes, and very much of it is his correspondence. So he was very busy. I tell you as a sincere friend that you must immediately retire from active politics if you do not desire to die an inglorious death. You wanted chiefly Hindu-Muslim unity in India, and they have tactfully managed to undo your work by creation of the Pakistan and India separation. <coughs> or separately. You wanted freedom for India, but they have given permanent dependence of India. Oops. You wanted to do something for the upliftment of the position of the bungies, means the sweepers, the so-called outcasts. But they are still rotting as bungies, even though you are living in the bungie colony. They are all, therefore, illusions. And when these things will be presented to you as they are, you must consider them as God sent. God has favored you by dissipating the illusion you were hovering in. And by the same illusion you were nursing those ideas as truth. But, um, Gandhi wrote what he called his autobiography. It actually deals with uh, rather limited portion of his life, and he called his, as a subtitle, The Story of My Experiments with Truth. Later, Srila Prabhupada would criticize this. He would say, what is the idea of experimenting with truth? Truth is there. No need to experiment. <laughs> uh, so he seems to be alluding to this. What is he saying? He's saying, Gandhi, you're actually, you're so famous, but you're actually a failure. What you wanted to do, it's not happening. And so he advises him, you should, you should give all of this politics up, and you should simply preach Bhagavad Gita. Well, as it happens, uh, this letter was July 12, 1949. In um, January, January 1948, so just a few months later, uh, Gandhi was assassinated. At point blank range, he was shot, not by a Muslim, but by an, uh, by a Hindu, and it was a <coughs> Hindu so-called Brahmin. <laughs> and he explained later in court his reason for doing it, because he said that this Gandhi was spoiling Hinduism. Well, Gandhi didn't really care about Hinduism. He was uh, trying to promote, you know, some coming together of different people and so on. Anyway, so as I said, Prabhupada was uh, prophetic when he says um, you should give up active politics if you do not desire to die an inglorious death. Here we have a bit more timeline. Uh, some highlights before he goes to, to the West. 1933 Srila uh, Prabhupada accepted formal diksha from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur in Allahabad, where he had his uh, business, his pharmacy. He was a householder, he was doing his business. And this means it was 11 years after he had met Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur for the first time. In 1944, so another 11, year, 11 years, uh, he starts his, his magazine, Back to Godhead, 
in February 1944. Um, we have with us a sample, not from, not from that far back. Um, yeah, well this is number three from, say, the, the reincarnation of Back to Godhead magazine. Uh, after she probably came to the West, came to New York, <laughs> and Abhinand Prabhu has uh, a wonderful collection of uh, memorabilia from Srila Prabhupada. So this was uh, 15 cents, so less than one-fifth of one dollar, and this is volume one, number three. And uh, in this issue, Allen Ginsberg, Reflections on the Mantra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Allen Ginsberg was a very popular poet, American beat poet. 1951, uh, Srila Prabhupada takes uh, the Vanaprastha order in that sense that he permanently separates from his family, he moves to Vrindavan. Uh, he lives in Vrindavan and sometimes in Delhi for some time. Uh, in 1953 in Jhansi, just south of Vrindavan. And there uh, in Jhansi where he tries to start up a, um, a, an institute which he calls the League of Devotees. He initiates his first disciple, Acharya Prabhakar. Uh, well, I got a little ahead of myself. It's 1956 when he really moves to Vrindavan after the Jhansi project uh, kind of collapses uh, for, for uh, per peripheral reasons, no fault of Srila Prabhupada. Um, and then in 1959, Srila Prabhupada accepts sannyas. Uh, this uh, event takes place in Mathura uh, at the Gaudiya Mat, uh, which is in the charge of his god brother, His Holiness uh, uh, V. Kesha Maharaj. Bhakti Prabhupada. Um, Bhakti Prabhupada. Yes, that's Bhakti Pranayana, Kesha Maharaj. Yeah. 1962, uh, Prabhupada publishes the first volume, Canto One, of Srimad Bhagavatam. His first canto he'll publish in three volumes, and it'll be those three volumes that Srila Prabhupada takes uh, to the West. 1964 is volume 2, completed 1965 is when Prabhupada goes to Calcutta after he's made arrangement with Sumati Murarji, uh, the owner of the shipping company, which um, gives him passage to New York. So his first trip uh, out of India will lead to New York. And then Srila Prabhupada arrives in New York. So-called Big Apple. The Big Rotten Apple. <laughs> <laughs> and there we can say, um, indeed, Prabhupada delivers matchless gifts. Prophetically, the name of the shop uh, that's on 26 and the number 26, 2nd Avenue. Um, Manhattan, which is the central part of New York, Manhattan is an island, uh, is, is largely organized. Uh, the streets are very much in a grid pattern. Um, and um, the north-south running streets are avenues and uh, the east-west streets are streets 
And so you have First Avenue, Second Avenue, Third Avenue, Fourth Avenue, Fifth Avenue, Sixth. It just goes like that. And then First Street, Second Street, and it goes all the way up um, to um, to the park, um, 72nd Street. I don't, I don't remember how high up it goes. But uh, Sheila Prabhupada was very much on the south end in this uh, area uh, of New York, which was rather run down. Uh, it's had something of a revival in recent years. Uh, it's, it's become not the most high-end place, but it's still very expensive property there. And uh, when Srila Prabhupada was in Matchless Gifts, um, it, it's a building uh, which has a few shops, and Matchless Gifts is on the very far end, the right end of this building. And then immediately after this was a petrol station. So it sort of opened out to this petrol station. The last time I was in New York, a um, year and a half ago, uh, I was quite shocked to see that the petrol station is gone, and uh, the area where the petrol station was is completely fenced around, just like uh, you had this apartment building area fenced around for building. And a big sign showing a picture of a high-rise construction going up, which by now is probably mostly finished. I don't know. And it's such an odd thing to see. There's matchless gifts is dwarfed, you know, by this huge building that's going up immediately next to it. <laughs> but the humble beginnings uh, of the Krishna consciousness movement. It just sort of highlights even more uh, what humble beginnings the Krishna consciousness movement had in New York. And again, the prophetic name Matchless Gifts because previously someone uh, had a gift shop there and they called it Matchless Gifts. And well, actually, yes. Uh, what is a more matchless gift than and so very much from here, although uh, we heard before, uh, initially on the Bowery and now on the Lower East Side, <coughs> gradually Prabhupada starts getting some, some people interested in what he's doing, taking more seriously, uh, some starting to starting to uh, chant and follow Srila Prabhupada. This picture of uh, Panchatattva, I, I believe, it must have been painted by Jadurani Mataji, uh, a.k.a. Shamarana. And uh, this was commissioned by Srila Prabhupada. And this picture was in the front window uh, of the preaching center, 26 Second Avenue, and I believe that the this original, I'm not 100% sure it's the original, but I think it is, is now in Radhadesh. Yeah, you're confirming. Yeah, yeah it's just hanging in the uh, entryway. Um, the East Village Other is the name of a newspaper, um, a hippie newspaper, you could say, but nonetheless a newspaper. And here we see an article uh, with what would become a quite famous photograph of Srila Prabhupada uh, standing, the picture on the left, he's standing in front of this, I guess, oak tree in Tompkins Square Park, uh, and he's just giving a, a, a short speech um, about what is this Krishna consciousness and what is this chanting, and the people are standing around, they're curious, what is this, who is this, what's going on. 
So this is, uh, and the mood, again, the mood at that time, um, as we heard from Kadamba Kanada Swami, it was very intense, and it was, there was a kind of explosive excitement in the air. Um, we'll get to some more of that in a moment. And so here it says, save Earth now. <laughs> so they identified Srila Prabhupada as, you know, a preacher for save Earth now. Perhaps also prophetic for uh, the environmental. <clears throat> in the U.S. in particular, um, there was a very intense political atmosphere. At this time, uh, America was uh, deeply involved in Vietnam, of all places, on the other side of the planet. Um, the propaganda was, we have to hold back communism. Communism is the big danger of the world, and it must be stopped. And if we don't stop it in Vietnam, it's going to go from there to... Indonesia and from there to Australia and before you know it they'll be in, on our doorstep and so uh, the US government was um, was running this war and the protest against the war was building momentum in America as I was going to university, my own university, uh, were some of the most vocal activists uh, against the war. And uh, there would be large rallies of students and uh, sometimes marches and sometimes confrontations uh, as we see in this image. Uh, sometimes they would even call out uh, what's called the National Guard. These are kind of like army uh, for within the country. And um, sometimes the, the army would throw tear gas at us, at the students. <coughs> tear gas is horrible, horrible stuff. It gets to your eyes um, and your throat. So it was a very intense atmosphere. And Srila Prabhupada came into this middle of this atmosphere and he said something very shocking. He said, um, he said, war, uh, it is the duty of Kshatriyas to fight. And he was speaking about Bhagavad Gita, speaking about Arjuna. Arjuna is a Kshatriya, he should fight. Um, and so, Prabhupada was kind of completely ignoring <laughs> the, the, the spirit among the young people at that time for whom, um, you know, anything to do with war, it was all about um, uh, peace and so on. We, we, should, we should give up war, we should be pacifists and so on. Prabhupada said, no. <clears throat> And what else was going on in uh, American culture at the time? Just uh, two or three examples of some films that came out at the time. Uh, one of them, a, a, a comedy, was called "It's uh, called The Russians Are Coming." <laughs> so, you know, that that was very much in the minds, you know, the, all of the Russians. <laughs> Danger. And on the other side, there was a, 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 a grand film uh, called The Bible. <laughs> this sort of uh, very, how to say, uh, oh, I'm a little tired, I don't have my words with me. Anyway, it was a very mixed sort of culture. At this time also, uh, other we may want to say, spiritual leaders were coming to America. There was 
Tidi Suzuki, uh, who was a kind of um, ambassador for Zen Buddhism. He, he brought um, Zen Buddhism to America. Everyone gives credit to Suzuki for that. And then it was popularized by this um, writer, the speaker, Alan Watts. At around the same time, or actually later, there was uh, introduction of Hindu meditation, especially by uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, uh, who was very popular, and he became even more popular when the Beatles also went and spent time with him uh, in India. And then there was introduction of Tantra, or quasi-tantra by the likes of Rajneesh, uh, a very, I have to say, colorful character, uh, uh, who uh, started a community in Oregon while his followers collected Rolls Royces for him, such that he could drive or ride in a different Rolls Royce every day. Um, they tried to take over um, the political control of the area of, uh, of Oregon by some rather strange uh, means. There's a whole history of that. And then asana yoga, which of course now is, is just totally mainstream, it's everywhere, but uh, BKS Iyengar in particular uh, in America, he was uh, bringing this to everyone's attention. So all these, you can say, competing ideas uh, and practices were there. And especially these things were um, of interest in uh, the places on the East Coast of America and the West Coast. In particular, New York, Boston, Washington, perhaps, and then on the West Coast, especially San Francisco, and just across the bay from San Francisco is Berkeley, uh, which is where the university is, where I was studying. Well, again, Prabhupada settled uh, for some time in the Lower East Side, this really unlikely place. Uh, Unlikely in the sense that mm, it would not have been the first choice of any of Srila Prabhupada's godbrothers if uh, they would dare to come to America. Uh, one of Prabhupada's godbrothers did go uh, to uh, England and then to Germany, <coughs> Bhakti Fridai Bonmar for some time, and uh, he established a small center in London, which, as I understand, is still there. Um, but Prabhupada came to this unlikely place, Lower East Side of Manhattan. And, yes, as we've seen, he proceeded. This is not Tompkins Square Park, this is Washington Square Park. Uh, the other place that uh, Prabhupada and the devotees would go to chant in those early days. <coughs> yeah, um, it's a special characteristic, we can say, of Prabhupada that he brought not just himself, not just uh, a style of yoga, for example, or something of that nature, but rather he brought with him an entire, an entire, uh, an entire culture. And to do this, we can say he was translating culture at the same time. He was, um, of course, translating from uh, Sanskrit, from Bengali into English language, but he was also translating by his ways of presentation. He was explaining in ways for Westerners to understand. He would give analogies, he would, he would share stories. Um, 
in the very early days in New York, there's one recording where he's speaking to some people, uh, and um, by this, at this time, uh, he has no paintings, no pictures of Krishna to show anyone. And he's talking about Krishna and he's saying how beautiful Krishna is. And he's trying to get his audience to understand, you know, the wonder of Krishna's form. And he, he says in this one lecture, at one point he, he, he asks his audience, have you seen a picture of Krishna? <laughs> and you can't see them, it's an audio recording, but you can sort of imagine the blank faces, sort of. <laughs> so yeah, he, uh, Prabhupada inspired what nowadays we call a lifestyle. Um, that, that term, I'm not sure I'm happy with because it suggests fashion. You know, like you dress a certain way today and tomorrow another day, another way, and maybe you're changing fashion at every season or at least once a year. Uh, people, of course, many people take on lifestyles that way. <laughs> they change their style uh, every now and then. Oh, I've changed my lifestyle now. Um, but Prabhupada introduced, um, yeah, we can we can say the mm, the original lifestyle. How's that? Uh, which is more than a style, and that is um, to to summarize. Prabhupada would use this expression: simple living and high thinking. And as I've said, um, I believe this was either Gandhi's or Vivekananda. Well, um, as I said, I've presented this for one course introducing Prabhupada, and I, I wanted to show that Prabhupada's um, legacy is there, that there are now um, ashramas, uh, which in English would be called a hermitage. Uh, the first of these was New Vrindavan in what is called uh, West Virginia in America. And what you see on the top left is a picture of Prabhupada uh, at New Vrindavan. And on the right, on the top, is Itanagri, and also on the right bottom, Itanagri, which, as I understand, as I've heard, has been developing very nicely. Uh, it's become established now um, in such a way that um, they, mm, they have a system now for distributing the milk of the cows to regular customers in the New York and um, Washington areas. Um, <coughs> And so, and they've also received uh, considerable support from the government to expand their cow protection program, which is quite interesting to get from the government. They've gotten uh, at least uh, two or three hundred thousand dollars for that. Well, then I made some comparisons, uh, some. <coughs> contrasts of Gandhi and Prabhupada. Unlike Gandhi, Prabhupada considered world peace to be possible by propagation of Krishna's teachings in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, unlike Gandhi, Prabhupada did not agree with his interpretation of the Gita as symbolic, or as te teaching essentially non-violence. Unlike Gandhi, Prabhupada insisted on rejecting all bodily identification, whether by gender, by nationality, race, or religion, as temporary and mundane. Unlike Gandhi, Prabhupada did not approve of his fasting. Gandhi used to fast for political reasons. Um, 
people would feel bad, oh, Gandhiji is passing, we should stop killing each other, something like that. Um, and Gandhi said, sorry, Prabhupada said, this kind of uh, fasting, this kind of austerity, Bhagavad Gita says, is in the mode of passion, it's Rajagita. Which means the result is temporary, it's not permanent. Unlike Gandhi, Prabhupada established devotional processions worldwide rather than political processions. Uh, Gandhi was famous for his salt march uh, in which he gathered several hundred people and they marched to the ocean in order to collect salt. And this was a political protest, again, against the British. Uh, because of the salt tax. He said, we'll get our own salt, thank you very much. And so they did like that. It was a political march. Prabhupada, on the other hand, uh, established Ratha Yatra, Jagannath Ratha Yatra Ki um, Okay, time is passing. Literary legacies, as I mentioned, 98 or 98 volumes, 99 volumes of collected works of Gandhi, which it's all downloadable from the internet. Um, Prabhupada wrote some 60 volumes, uh, which, as we all know, mainly translations of, from Sanskrit and Bengali. Um, his 17 volume Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, from Bengali was quite significant because of bringing what was otherwise really not, not known. Krishna was, some idea of Krishna was there in the West, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, nothing not known at all. And first, well, that was the broadest to the psychiatry in the uh, case was in the yeah, it was a document because one uh, devotee was in the psychiatric ward in New York and to sort of document that, you know, this person is not, he's not mad, he's just a devotee. <laughs> and, and anyway, who is actually crazy? So this, uh, this was produced uh, in mimeograph, and you can see it was done with little staples, and it says here, 25 cents. Uh, it first says 35 cents, and that's crossed out, <laughs> and then it's 25 cents. <laughs> it's issued by the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, 26 Second Avenue, in parentheses, between 1st and 2nd streets. <laughs> New York, New York, phone, If you want happiness, if you want perfection in your life, then just begin to dovetail your desires, activities, and potentials with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then you will see what real happiness is and can tell who is really great. <laughs> That was advice to psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we have 
This is the record which was requested by uh, this man who was working for Macmillan. He had uh, contacted the temple and uh, had made an order. Um, he had, I don't know, somehow heard about this, this LP record. Now this technology <laughs> is kind of, you don't, you don't see it anymore, uh, but this was standard. If you wanted to hear uh, you know, audio recordings, you had to have one of these, and you had to have a device, which, you know, like this, and, and yeah, that's how it works. Uh, <laughs> um, so, when, when Brahmananda got that order uh, from Prabhupada, find a printer, and then came this um, request from this man at Macmillan, Brahmananda was having some anticipation, you know, maybe this is a lead, but then when he came there, he thought, he's just a lowly accountant. Uh, he has nothing to do with decision-making of, you know, of uh, publishing. Uh, and at that moment, as he was sitting with this, uh, with this man, with this uh, accountant, the chief editor walked in, <laughs> walked into that office, just happened to walk in. Macmillan, this is a big publisher, the chief editor walked in, <laughs> and Brahmananda said, we have a Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and the chief editor said, really, I'm looking for a Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and it all, you know, it started, because one man wanted this album. So there it is. And on the back, yeah, this is the album in which Srila Prabhupada sings, the Maha Mantra, and then he gives this very, very wonderful little speech uh, explaining the Maha Mantra, uh, which was from Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur. This is the happening uh, records incorporated. <laughs> happening. Used to listen. Oh, it says George Harrison used to listen to this. So. And then this was the big hit, uh, which um, became. Which year was it? 1969? Yeah, something, yeah, something like that. This was the Hare Krishna mantra on a 45 RPM record. This was the size of a record you'd get for a, what's called a single. So it would be a single song on one side and one other song on the other side. Uh, and uh, this became, in England, what's called Top of the Pops. Everyone was hearing the Hare Krishna Mantra. This was going on. But this one is, this edition is Yugo Tong. <laughs> Yugo Tong. Yeah. 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 Can you explain? Okay. I will speak in English so that anyway there is translation. So um, this record, the internet. Hello. Okay. So this record. Uh, became number one also in Yugoslavia because it was printed in Yugoslavia uh, by Yugoton uh, and, and many of our parents they were also listening to this and maybe some you can, you can ask them huh that's why yeah that's why some <laughs> devotees here uh, the point is that devotees uh, was they, they were uh, writing letters to George Harrison so that he should come to Yugoslavia and to establish temple here. 
It was written Radha Krishna temple. And um, after that, uh, Prabhupada uh, also got informed about this, that, the, that there are people in Yugoslavia who are very much interested in the Krishna consciousness. So he wrote a letter which you can find in the database about Yugoslavia. And he said that, yes, this is a communist country. So that means they're very fallen. And especially need a lot of help. <laughs> it's exactly like this. And so he, uh, he instructs some of his devotees to go and preach in Yugoslavia. <laughs> and that was the first preaching done by uh, devotees in London. Mukunda Maharaj. Oh, I want to show this. <coughs> this is the also very famous the Radha Krishna Temple album. Wait, and um, no, the, the Goddess of Fortune. Okay. Um, so this was an earlier album made, um, and this is a double album. No, it's not double. It's just a big folder, uh, and it has uh, yeah, it has lyrics. It has Govinda prayers. Transcriptions and uh, transliteration and translations. Has pictures of Lord Chaitanya, everything is there. Um, and then it has at the end the message of Krishna and a little uh, explanation of the mantra. I wanted to show this one because I have a, a bit of a relationship to this album. Uh, which is, it has um, Yamuna Devi's Govindam prayers on it and uh, others of her singing. But at a certain point, this was 1970, 74, 75, uh, I was in Germany and the idea came that uh, these records should be mass produced and distributed widely, especially for uh, fundraising, uh, because the idea came that we want to purchase some substantial property. So I was one of those foot soldiers sent out with <laughs> this album, and we used to go anywhere and everywhere. Um, I also spent some time in Denmark, and we used to go door to door all over Denmark. I think I visited every single village in Denmark, no matter how small. They used to drive us to a village and drop us off and come back later in the day. So there was nothing to do but to go to everybody. And we'd, we'd sell, we would sell these. Albums. This and uh, another an actual double album of Srila Prabhupada's bhajans, uh, which he recorded in Schloss Rettershof in Germany. Uh, they made a quite professional recording. Some of the best quality recording of Prabhupada bhajans was done in Germany. And that was done as a, a double two albums. And we used to distribute that. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> anyway, um, this was a bit of a, a trip down memory lane, so to say, but also going all the way back to 
uh, Srila Prabhupada's uh, lifetime in preparation. One point I, I think is uh, for us all to take uh, with us is that we can all similarly think of our lives as, uh, as preparing, um, whatever our age may be, and some of our ages were really getting on in age, and so many of you have so much life before you, but we can be thinking, okay, I'm preparing now. What is it that I'm going to do to make a mark uh, for, uh, for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, for Srila Prabhupada, for the Vaishnavas? What can we do? Rather than thinking, okay, I'm sort of doing what I do and it's going to kind of go on this same tilt for the rest of my life and uh, it's going to all kind of slow down at some point and then eventually I will fade away. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not, that's not the way she would probably. When, when everyone was saying to him in Vrindavan and then Sumati Muranji, they were saying, Swamiji, you're too old, you can't go to, to America. Forget it. You're an old man. He ignored that. I'm preaching to myself now. <laughs> so. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you all so much. Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai. Shiva Prabhupada Yasa Puja. Mahotsava Ki Jai. Ananta Goti Vaishnava Linda Ki Jai. Shishi Pancha Tattva Ki Jai. Itai Go Rehma Nandhi.